Welcome to part two of uh, Famous Deaf Americans. I'm Robert Panar, professor of English and drama at National Technical Institute for the Deaf at Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. The Deaf American has come a long way since the year 1817, when the first school for the deaf was established in Hartford, Connecticut. He has overcome the handicap of deafness and earned his rightful place in the sun. And while doing that, we have really proved our value. We have overcome the handicap of deafness and contributed to the cultural growth of America. This program focuses on the life stories of several deaf Americans. When Robert Ripley, the famous cartoonist, first saw the dance team of Francis Woods and Billy Bray, he was so impressed that he called them, quote, the wonder dancers. So they were a wonder because the woman who danced with such grace and beauty was Francis Woods. Totally deaf. Francis Wood, whose real name is Esther Thomas, was born in Ohio. She was born a premature baby, one and a half pounds, and born without an ear drum. She went to the Ohio School for the Deaf, where she played basketball. She met one summer hearing man named Anthony Kelly Gawir, who was a good dancer and looked like Rudolph Valentino. The two met on a dance floor and fell in love. Thereafter, Anthony taught uh, Francis to dance by teaching her to follow uh, four, four time for rhythm or three, four time to the rhythm. And she became a marvelous dancer. Two were married in 1926 and began to dance professionally. First, it was difficult because of the great depression, but the two persevered and went on with the fall. In 1933, they got their first break. They danced for RKO productions on the stage in different theater houses. Mm. They danced the French Apothry, the Adagio dance, became very successful. Then they started to add and add dances to their repertory. They would dance different dances according to popularity of the times. Mm. The fox trot, the wolf, the rumba, <laughs> the samba, <laughs> different things like that. Frances Woods made all her own mm, uh, costumes. Often she would throw sex coins, like 26,000 sequins, throw them on her dress one <coughs> at a time. During the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, to dance to all the great big bands. For example, dance with Todd Ween, Wayne King, Cab. Callaway, Eddie Dawson, Paul Whitman, and one Lawrence Welk 
opened for its first professional engagement in Chicago. The two won the dancers dance for his band. More than that, they taught Lawrence Welk to become the fine dancer that he is. Ripley was right when he called them, quote, the wonder dancers. Today, after 55 years of marriage, the two are still dancing together. <laughs> Thomas made aviation history when he flew from east to west mm -hmm, in 1947. His feet was more difficult than what Lindbergh did many years before. Lindbergh flew from California to New York. Why? Because Roland Thomas was deaf, couldn't use radio. Mm -hmm. Roland Thomas was born in Missouri uh, from birth. He went to the Missouri School for the Deaf. When he graduated, he went to Washington, D.C. and became a printer, mm, working for the Washington Post newspaper. During his free time, he took lessons in flying. <laughs> so he earned his pilot's license. He saved his money bought his own plane and decided to go from east to west. He had a good reason to do that. First, he wanted to be the first deaf person to do that alone. Second, he wanted to meet two hearing friends who had taught him to fly. Those two men named Cliff Evans and George Truman had already flown uh, around the world mm, in small Piper Cubs, the first two men to do that. Mm, mm -hmm. So Roland uh, Thomas wanted to meet them when they arrived in California. In October 1947, Roland took off from re Hobart Beach, Delaware, in a small Piper Cub. Mm, stop for gas, mm, stop for gas. Three days later, he arrived in Los Angeles, California, met his two friends. Mm. In honor of his wonderful achievement, Roland Thomas received a gold medal from the White House in Washington, D.C. in September 1948. On that medal, it said, Roland Thomas, first deaf to fly solo from east to west. In 1979, the New York City newspapers published an article about an accident that happened in mm, subway station. A young woman had her hand sliced off when she was pushed onto the train tracks. Mm. Quick work by a team of ambulance medics. The woman brought her to the hospital and her hand was reattached again through method of microsurgery. Microsurgery is a new kind of operation used by a team of specially trained doctors who use powerful microscopes while operating. With a remarkable operation, but more remarkable is the fact that the person who 
taught that a group of surgeons was a deaf man named Dr. Donald Ballantyne Jr., director of the microsurgery training unit in NYU Medical Center in New York City. Dr. Ballantyne was born deaf in far away China. He went to different schools in China and in France and Germany. Later on, he went to a prep school in Connecticut, then went to Princeton University, graduated with a degree in chemistry. Then he went to Washington, D.C., to Catholic University, where he got an MS in chemistry and PhD in biology. After several years of work in different places in the field of parasitology, Dr. Ballantyne got work in NYU Medical Center as a research associate in the field of experimental surgery. He had different pioneering methods of skin and organ mm. transplants using many, many laboratory rats, and he is credited with finding new methods of transplanting human kidneys. Dr. Ballantyne has written 75 different mm, articles printed in medical journals all over the world. He has taught in different universities, hospitals, research centers, and he is known as expert in that field. He has also written a book on that topic. Mm micro mm, uh, surgery. In 1979, CBS TV presented the dramatization of a true story that happened in 1965. It was about young Spark, deaf mute, named Donald Lang, who was accused of uh, murder. And also was about the efforts of young deaf lawyer named Lowell Myers who was trying to defend that black deaf mute. Donald Lang, the black deaf mute, was a very difficult case. He couldn't speak, he couldn't read, he couldn't read lips, he didn't know sign language, he couldn't write, he couldn't communicate. Chicago courts were faced with very difficult problem. How could Donald Lang defend himself if he couldn't communicate? They got young deaf lawyer, Lowell Myers, to defend him. Through Myers' help, he succeeded in the courtroom to prove that Lang was not guilty and he freed him. Unfortunately, six months later, Lang was accused of another murder. That story, which was called the most unusual law case in American law history, was later published in a book called uh, The Dummy, written by Ernest Tardyman. Later, it was made into a major TV movie. Lowell Myers himself was a remarkable person. 
He became deaf when he was 12 years old. He graduated from high school. And then he went to Spahn Marshall University. He wanted to major in the law. In between, he got his BS and MS degrees from Chicago University in business. He wanted to major in law later on. Spahn Marshall U thought it was difficult for a deaf person to become a lawyer. But he succeeded. He graduated second in his class, graduating with honors. Oh, well, Myers has also written a book called mm, Law and the Deaf. He has fought to provide interpreters for deaf persons any time they face courtroom trials. In many ways, he has fought for equal rights for the deaf, and he is still fighting for equal rights. He has become a role model for future deaf lawyers. <laughs>
third person to win that. John Ruben Stein, a Hollywood actor who acted the role of the hearing man in that play, won award for the best actor. And the writer Mark Madoff won the award for the best play of the year. <laughs> Linda Bob was born in New Jersey. She was born deaf, and her parents were also deaf. She went to the New Jersey School for the Deaf, graduated, then went to Gallaudet College, where she majored in library science. She also participated in many plays. After graduation, she was invited to join the National Theater of the Deaf as a founding member. With the NTD, she traveled all over the United States and Europe. She also helped found the Little Theater of the Deaf and acted in many plays and directed other plays. Possessing brains, beauty, and a natural talent for acting, Linda Bob today has become one of our brightest stars on TV. She was the first deaf person to have a role in CBS TV, longest running soap opera, Search for Tomorrow. She was the deaf girlfriend of uh, Franz Henry Winkler in that popular ABC TV show, mm, Happy Days. With Marlo uh, Thomas, she fed the award called the Amita Italian American Award for Outstanding Work on Television in 1974. Ever since 1972, Linda has been a permanent member of that popular children's TV program, Sesame Street. Her pretty face is often shown in the children's magazine, Sesame Street, where she makes words in sign language. By communicating with hands that talk, Mm. Linda Bob is showing how deaf person can help develop deaf awareness and same time contribute to the world of television. Kitty O'Neill has been called Hollywood's most amazing stunt woman. Danger is nothing new to Kitty O'Neill. When she was three months old, she almost died from uh, measles. That left her totally deaf. She grew up on an Indian reservation. Nobody knew how to communicate with the deaf or teach the deaf. Her mother, a full-bodied Indian, decided to do something about that. Her mother went to the University of Texas to learn how to educate the deaf, got a degree, and taught the kitty to lip read and speak. In 1970, kitty met a stunt man named Duffy Hambleton who taught Kitty all the tricks connected with stunts. Six 
years later, in 1976, a frigate joined an organization called uh, Skunks Unlimited. Thereafter, she became standard for women in movies who go through awful danger. She jumps off horses. <laughs> she jumps off big boats. <laughs> she runs through fire. <laughs> She was a standard for the bionic woman. She is often standing for a Wonder Woman, like something from 12 or 4. Kitty O'Neill made history in 1976 when she broke the world's record for speed for a woman. She drove rocket-powered car, the motivator, while she was strapped flat on the back. <laughs> Zoom to a world's record of 513 miles per hour. That beat the former old woman's record by 200 miles per hour, 513 miles per hour. That record is in Guinness Book of World Records. In 1981, Lou Ferrigno was told the National Chairman of a better speech than the hearing month. A few months later, he gave a speech to 3,000 body building followers. That was a big change from when Lou was a small boy. Soy and skinny 90 pound weakling. Mm -hmm. Lou Ferrigno was born in Brooklyn, New York. When he was three years old, he got an ear infection and lost 75 percent of his hearing. He became afraid to talk, and his friends in tough Brooklyn called him Duff Louie. When he was 16 years old, he decided to take up bodybuilding. His mother thought he was crazy, but <coughs> continued. When he was 19, he participated in the Mr. News Jersey bodybuilding contest and finished in 22nd place. But Lou persisted. Later on, he won the Mr. Teen Age America bodybuilding contest. And later, he won the Mr. Universe contest. Mm -hmm. Twice. Then he tried out for the role of uh, the Incredible Hulk mm -hmm. TV movie special. He won the role, and ever since we see him on TV as uh, the Incredible Hulk. Mm -hmm. Big change from that mm -hmm. skinny side kid. <laughs> 